Thanks, Elijah. Good morning, church. How are we? <laughs> Good morning. Ah, Good to see you guys. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Good morning to everyone who's in person. Good morning to everyone uh, on live stream today. Happy Father's Day. Uh, typically, I think like and now as I'm a father, I'm like, what do I want for Father's Day? To be left alone, you know? Just everyone go out, give me some time. Maybe that's not good, but anyways, happy Father's Day. Uh, this is a special Sunday, so we made an announcement a few weeks ago. Uh, my last Sunday at the well will be next Sunday, but this is actually going to be my last sermon preaching at the well. Uh, God uh, has kind of led my family and I to move to Seattle to take a lead position, a lead pastor position uh, out in on the West Coast. And so we are excited, but it's, uh, it's bittersweet uh, for this to be our last one. But thank you for coming. Uh, we are in a series uh, <coughs> called Around the Well, where we are kind of just talking about why is our church called the well? Wh- what does that symbolize? What does that represent? Uh, Pastor Matt, our lead pastor, who uh, is usually here, he's uh, taking a much-needed break today, uh, has been doing a great job just explaining to us the meaning of the well and how the well symbolizes this eternal life, right? The well of eternal life and, our, and the need to declare the gospel. And so today we're going to be more focusing on not just declaring the gospel, but demonstrating uh, the gospel as we kind of see it uh, displayed in Revelation 22. So as we begin, let's pray and we will then uh, get started. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, God, we thank you for today and we thank you for um, another Sunday where we can gather together in person and virtually uh, as your body and to worship you, uh, to sing to you, and to hear from your word. And God, we need you. Uh, We can do nothing. Your word says that we can do nothing apart from you. And so God, uh, no matter the distractions, no matter the week that was, God, would you give us the strength just to abide right now? And that you would, uh, and and that you would produce, God, a righteousness, a fruit uh, from this time. Lord, would you just be with me? Would the words that come to my mouth be honoring and true to your word? Uh, that which is not of you, would, that, would we just all easily dismiss? But that which is of you, Lord, would you use that to shape us and mold us uh, more into the image of Jesus Christ? Uh, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, since this is... Uh, my last Sunday preaching, I wanted to like share a really profound quote with you, uh, like a Shakespeare or some other really smart person. Uh, but the reality is, is I went to community college, and that's just not really me. And so uh, what I got is, is George Lucas, okay? Star Wars. So any Star Wars fans in here? Okay, great. I'm going to nerd out on you. All right, so when I was in high school, college, I loved the prequel trilogy, okay? Does ev- everyone know what I mean by the prequel trilogy? Okay. You know what? I thought the prequels kind of sucked, and, uh, and then the sequel trilogy happened, and then I was like, oh, it kind of made the prequel trilogy a little bit better in my eyes. But anyways, I still love them, and I remember, I was just obsessed. How does Anakin Skywalker become Darth Vader? So I was obsessed with this question. And I remember when the preview of episode three, Revenge of the Sith came out. I literally, I was in college, I think I was a sophomore in college, I watched that trailer multiple times a day, right? I was the type of person that I would like pause and like, what's going on in this screenshot? All right, next screenshot. I watch it every day. Literally, I can quote the beginning of the trailer for you, all right? Palpatine, the, the Phantom Menace, right? He's having this conversation with Anakin and he's like, the dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities, some considered to be unnatural, right? And Anakin, like the whiny teenager, is like, how can I get this power, you know? And Palpatine's like, not from a Jedi. I'm like, ah, you know? Uh, I just, I was, I'm nerding out right now, but I loved it. And then I, so I'd watch that preview all the time. And then uh, the, it was time for the midnight premiere. So that's when they did, you know, midnight premiere. And I got to that theater with my Jedi cloak, okay, my plastic lightsaber. Uh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> got there like at 8 p.m., got in my seat, and watched all these nerds have these lightsaber battles, right, for like four hours, and then finally watched the movie. And you know what? I think for this movie, it lived up to the hype for me, right? Uh, the preview did justice to the movie. It sucks when a preview is better than a movie, but for this instance, the preview lived up, uh, pointed to the greatness of the movie. And so the reason why I share this, why I'm nerding out on you uh, a little bit this morning, is because as, as God's people, uh, we're a preview, right? God has called us, uh, we're his people, we're the bride of Christ, we, uh, Paul says in Philippians 3.20 that we are citizens of heaven. Even though that we live on earth, we are citizens of heaven. And because we are citizens of heaven, we are to operate, we are to behave, we are to believe in what heaven, how he heaven is and how heaven operates, right? We are a preview of what is to come. And in this passage today, in Revelation 22, that's the end game, right? Revelation 22, that's the movie. That's what, how eternity is going to play out. And so if God calls us to be a preview of what is to come, then we need to study what is to come so that we can be the best preview that, uh, that we can be, all right? And so as we look at this passage today, as we do this series around the well, in this passage, we're going to see this, this living water, right, that's giving uh, life to this whole kingdom. We want to see, study what is to come so that we can model it today so that people can taste and see the goodness of God. And so what we're going to see are three things in this passage as we study uh, this passage in Revelation 22. Number one, we're going to see the holistic uh, nature of, of the kingdom of God. We're going to see the holistic nature of heaven, okay? Number two, we're going to see the rulers of heaven. Who are the rulers of heaven and what does it mean to rule, all right? And then number three, we're going to talk about what the power of the kingdom is. What's the source of this power? What's the source of this utopia that has been created, Right? And so as we study that, then we'll take principles of say, all right, how does this apply to the here and now as we try to live out being this preview? So the holistic nature of the kingdom, the rulers of the kingdom, and the power of the kingdom. So let's get into this. We're in Revelation 22. Now, Revelation 22, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is really complicated, actually. Uh, it's one of the most complicated. It's actually not the one of the most. It is the most complicated uh, book in all of Scripture. A famous theologian, John Calvin, he wrote a commentary on every book of the Bible except for Revelation. Uh, he's like, I'm just not touching that. And so the book is really complicated, except actually the ending uh, of Revelation, though, is very simple. Uh, anyone can really understand it. Uh, and it's basically this. Jesus returns. He wipes out evil, takes Satan and his followers, and throws them in the lake of fire for eternity, and he establishes his kingdom on earth. So in Revelation 21, literally heaven comes down to earth and the kingdom of God is now finally restored. And so now in Revelation 22, we see what this kingdom, this heaven on earth looks like. And so let's take a look at it. Uh, first off, what we see is there's this river. All right, the river of the water of life. So this is why we're called the well, right? So this, this river is this water of life, and it comes from the throne room of God, where the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, rules and reigns. And so from Jesus' throne, this river flows out, and it flows out through these streets in the middle of what? Look at verse 2. This river uh, flows through the middle of the street of the city. Now, isn't that interesting? Eternity is a city. Now, this is somewhat symbolic. I'm sure there might be rural parts as well. But do you see uh, kind of the story arc of, of the Bible? See, in Genesis 1, creation begins in a garden, right? But then it ends in a city. Isn't that interesting? We as, as people, even as Christians, sometimes we're like, man, I want to leave the city, 
This is a God-forsaken place. I'm tired of the city, and I, and I hate to break it to you. God's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to bring you to a city for eternity. And so what we see is that it's this city. Uh, and in this city, the, the, the river of life f- flows through the c- city, and on either side of the river, continuing in verse 2, we see the tree of life. Now, uh, if you have any kind of familiarity with Scripture, we, we know what the tree of life is. That should echo, point us back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, right? So when God created uh, the Garden of Eden, he created, there's these two trees, the tree of life, and he told Adam and Eve, if you eat from the tree of life, you will live forever. And then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And because humanity, uh, humans, were geniuses, we were like, we'll do, the <laughs> we'll do the bad tree, right? And so when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they were kicked out of the garden. And scripture literally says that there were like angels guarding over the tree of life where humans could no longer have access to that tree. And so what we see is since then, there's humanity has been striving to try to find that tree of life, right? To try to eat the fruit from that tree of life. But now in Revelation 22, we see this river flowing through the city on either side of the river is the tree of life. And notice about the tree. Notice what's going on with the tree. Uh, Continuing in verse 2, it yields its fruit each month. Now, why is that interesting? Why, did the, why is this in this kind of vision that John is having? Well, I'm not like a farmer or a gardener, but I, I, I do know this, that any type of fruit tree, there's a specific season for when that tree produces fruit, right? So we don't go apple picking uh, in the winter, right? We don't go apple picking in the summer. We go apple picking in the fall because a fruit tree has a specific time where it produces fruit. But notice the tree of life, it is producing fruit every single month. And I think scripture says it's producing different kinds of fruit every single month. See, for eternity, there's this abundance. Now, why is this important? You know, when I I see this abundance that this tree of life is, is producing, it reminds me of a party. Have you guys ever been to a party where there's not enough food? Uh, Have you ever hosted a party where you have not had enough food? Uh, That's happened to me uh, quite a few times because I'm kind of cheap, right? You get pizza for a group, and then it's like, oh, man, we do not have enough pizza. So you're slicing a slice into thirds, right? And people are, like, sharing it. You're like, oh, gosh, right? Everyone hates those parties. The best party to go to is when there is an abundance of food right? They, I mean, it's like not as all you can eat, like pizza or whatever, ribs or whatever you want. All you can eat food, uh, unlimited amount of drink. And then when you are leaving the party, the host gives you two or three plates on your way out. Those are the best parties, man. And what we see for eternity is, do you see the heart of God? God loves to give good gifts, Eternity isn't like, I'm just going to withhold this. God is pouring on abundance for eternity. The tree of life is producing nonstop fruit uh, for eternity. There is abundance. And then continuing, look at not just the fruit, but notice the leaves. Continuing in verse 2, notice the leaves. The leaves of the tree were for the what? For the healing of the nations. So here's the tree of life producing fruit, and the leaves, the leaves create the healing of the nations. Now that word healing, uh, the Greek word, this should ring a bell for you, the Greek word is therapia, right? That's where we get therapy, and uh, I just, not the brightest, uh, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, uh, and I just like, oh yeah, therapy means healing, right? Like, so when we go see our physical therapist, we, we're trying to get healed. When we're seeing our mental therapist, our counselor, we're, we're trying to be healed. And so this tree of life, the leaves, is bringing healing. But healing to who? To the nations. And that word nations, it's the word, Greek word is ethnos. And ethnos It could mean nations like America, China, Russia, India, Ethiopia, but it can also mean people groups, ethnicities, right? 
And so the tree of life has created this therapy, this healing for all people groups. Now, side note, notice this. Eternity, you don't lose your ethnicity, right? So sometimes we think of like the kingdom of God as this huge melting pot, but that's actually not the case. The kingdom of God are nations, are ethnic groups who come together in their ethnic identity, celebrating the most high God, right? But why do these people groups need to be healed? Why, why is there healing that needs to be taken place? Because look, we're under a curse. Look at verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed. The nations need to be healed because we are under a curse. Right? So, Middle East, every president, every administration, we're going to be the ones to bring peace to the Middle East. And it never happens. And why is that? Because the nations are under a curse. Uh, we just celebrated Juneteenth, and while there's progress that we're making towards racial justice and unity in our country, it feels like we can never get beyond that. There's always controversy. There's always uh, injustices happening. And, and why is that? Because we are under a curse. In Ethiopia, there is genocide happening. And it doesn't matter what generation you're part of or what decade you live in, there will always be stories of genocide. And why is that? It's because the nations are under a curse. And you see how humanity tries to deal with that curse. Uh, we try to deal with a supernatural problem through natural means. And what I mean by that is if the supernatural problem is we're under a curse, but we try to fight that naturally, right? So it's like, well, we can end racism through education, right? We can end genocide through education. So let's just educate but that never seems to do it, does it? We could maybe some maybe put their hope in political ideology, right? So on the right, it's like, hey, let's have less government so people can do the right thing. Well, that doesn't work. And then the left says, no, 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 let's, let's have institutions, government, make, you know, big government. That'll solve problems. And that doesn't work either. And why is that? It's under a curse because we're under a curse. Uh, and social justice kind of conversations, right? What's the root cause of all evil? They would say, at least in the West, it's white supremacy, right? And the goal is we have to dismantle white supremacy. But even if you, uh, I don't even know what that would look like, but even if you were to dismantle it, guess what's going to happen? Another supremacy will just rise and take its place. And why is that? Because we're under a curse. And, but eternity the curse is broken. And how is the curse broken? It's not broken through education or politics or reform or even morality. It is broken because of the Lamb of God who was slain on our behalf, who was cursed so that we could live in a place where the curse could be broken. And so we see in eternity the nations the ethnicities, there's healing internally in those communities and how they relate with one another and their relationship with God, there is healing. And then continuing, look at the kind of more the personal aspect. Verse four, they will see his face, the servants, right? These are the people of God, they're worshiping. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, does this mean as Christians we should get tattoos with like Jesus on our forehead, right? Maybe, is that the application? No, but uh, this is imagery of high priests. In the Old Testament, when a high priest was to offer a sacrifice for the people, they would literally have the name of Yahweh on their forehead. And that, that the name on their forehead just symbolizes who they belong to. And so here we have in eternity people who were once belonging to all different types of gods, but for eternity, those who have given their life to Christ, Christ's name is on their forehead. And you see, it doesn't, which shows us it doesn't matter necessarily who you are, it, it matters whose you are. But as we look at this, this image, do you, do you see the holistic nature of the kingdom of God? You know, growing up, we've kind of, you know, I, I remember the saying, which is true. It's like, hey, Christianity, it's, it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. 
And I remember just thinking, well, yeah, right? Like it's about having a personal relationship with Christ. And of course it is. It's true, right? As a Christian, we'll be in eternity. We'll have Christ's name on our forehead, whatever that looks like. But Christianity is so much more than that. The kingdom of God, what the gospel creates is this all-encompassing kingdom where the throne room of God, where the city of heaven literally comes down to earth and there are cities and there's, there are trees, there's in nature, there are nations, there's worship. And so the question is, if, if, this, is, if this is the movie, right? If, if, if this is the end game, if this is eternity, how do we as the people of God, as citizens of heaven now living on earth, how do we embody that? How do we preview that, foretaste that, foreshadow that to our, our community, to our community, to Silver Spring, to the cities, to the neighborhoods that we live in? How do we preview this? Well, I think we preview it by embodying the holistic nature of the kingdom. So a question I love, I want you to consider, I love to ask is, if Jesus were hypothetical, if Jesus were to come back, and rule and reign in Silver Spring, what would that look like? What would he do? What would start? What would stop? What would continue, right? What would it look like if Jesus said, like, all right, mayor, right, or whoever runs Silver Spring, like, I'm in charge. What would our city look like? Well, we know that there would be followers of Christ. Silver Spring right now is one of the most unreached neighborhoods or cities in the DMV. So we would know that there would be a, a plethora of Christ followers. And so we work to evangelize and disciple then. That's being a preview of what is to come, right? But then there's also more, right? The healing of the nations. So where there is um, brokenness, where there is div relational division, we as Christians we lean into that, and we be agents of reconciliation. Remember, God's purpose, he's in Colossians, he is reconciling all things to himself. And so we participate in the work of reconciliation. So where there might be racial injustices, we as the church, we lean in and we seek reconciliation. Where there is brokenness in families, right? We lean in and we work to bring reconciliation with families. If Jesus were to rule and reign in Silver Spring, would there be orphans? No, right? So right now, we work to end the foster care system. We know that that's, like, you know, that's not going to happen ultimately till Jesus returns, but we work because we're citizens of heaven. Like, all right, we're, let's, let's try to end the foster care system. Uh, if there's sickness and disease, we work to bring healing where there's sickness, you see, as to be a preview, we must be a, a, embrace the holistic nature of the kingdom of God. It does not serve us or our people well or our King Jesus if we were to say, just focus on one thing, say, just evangelism and, and forget um, people's needs. And it does not do well to focus just on people's needs and, and to disregard evangelism, that the kingdom of God is this holistic um, this holistic entity, and we are to be a preview of that. And so two kind of further kind of aspects of, of what that means as we try to be a preview holistically. Uh, I think it's what it means is we have to resist and then we have to restore. So resist is this. Um, we have to resist everything that is pulling us away from following Christ. Our flesh all right, our bodies are frail. We do, we're not living in redeemed bodies. Everything about our bodies are going to try to pull us away from following Christ. Man-made philosophies and values are going to try to pull us away. I was talking to one of my former students who's, I think she's 25 now, and she's part of this church that's really about doing social justice, which is a great, you know, that's a great thing. But what she was uh, kind of grieving or lamenting towards me was, David, people really care about kind of like the corporate systemic injustices, but like all my friends are kind of drinking with each other, sleeping around with one another, 
and they're kind of rejecting kind of that old school Christian morality. And if you listen to kind of modern day Christian thinkers, they're like, well, you need to deconstruct this and deconstruct that. And that's not really part of Christianity. But there's, listen, we have to resist that. <laughs> we have to resist that. The word of God is true. And in Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who meditates on the word of God day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water that will yield its fruit in its season. And everything he or she does, they will prosper. So we resist the world's ways and we embrace God's, but then we, we restore. And restore just means, you know, in Revelation 21, we see Jesus return and he wipes away every tear. And to be a preview of what is to come means you go to where there are tears and you wipe away tears. And that's hard because to enter into suffering requires a lot of work. But we are the preview of the kingdom. And if we're to be a, a, a biblical preview, we do not run away from suffering. We always run towards suffering. And so, that's the holistic nature. I just threw my pen. That's the holistic nature uh, of the kingdom of God, right? I hope you see just, it's more than just a personal relationship. But now the next question I have in this passage is, well, who are the rulers uh, of this kingdom? Who are the rulers? And look at the, the end of verse 5. It says, the night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they, God's people, will reign forever and ever. Now, isn't that interesting? We know for eternity, God's obviously like, you know, Jesus is king, so we know he's ruling. But what's interesting is this. God's people will be ruling alongside him. So for eternity, God's people will be reigning. Now, what does that word reign mean? To reign means to rule, to exercise dominion, right? To exercise authority. And this is something that I kind of think challenges my, my perception of heaven, of eternity. You know, I, I, growing up, I just kind of thought, all right, well, you know, I give my life to Christ. I have this personal relationship with him. And then when I die, I just kind of float into the clouds. And, and to be honest, that wasn't an exciting picture because I was just told like, hey, you're just going to be, you know, you're just going to be singing songs to God for eternity. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of like 90s Christianity. All right. So did anyone grow up Christian? Like any, okay, anyone grow up Christian? Yeah. So I grew up uh, in the 90s. And so my parents only let me listen to like Christian music. Right. So I'm thinking like, I, anyone know Michael W. Smith? Right? Yeah. So I'm thinking like, wait, you're telling me eternity, I'm going to be singing friends are friends forever, forever, right? <laughs> like, that's what I'm going to be doing forever. I was like, I'm, this is not exciting to me, you know? Um, and listen, to sing, God is amazing. And when you see anything that's amazing, like God, you want to sing, you want to rejoice. That's obviously a natural uh, response. But uh, worship is more than just singing. You know, worship is also what we see in this, in this passage. It's raining. And, and what is it, so what does that mean? What does that look like? A another way to kind of view reigning or view ruling is to bring order where there is chaos, right? Is to bring order where there's chaos. So think of God in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, it seems like there's no creation, right? And we, there's this image of the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. And it's this imagery of symbolism of like chaos. And then what does God do with the chaos? He creates. Day one, day two, day three, right? Uh, the earth, the land, the sea, the sun, the moon, the stars. There's order. When God's people were wandering in the desert, they had no direction. What does God do? He rules and reigns by exercising order. He gives them the law. Hey, this is how to live. These are things you should do. These are things you shouldn't do. Right? Uh, today's Father's Day. We dedicated a lot of kids first service. Uh, when you become a parent, you are, uh, you are given a cute bundle of chaos, <laughs> right? That kid cannot control his bowel system. He's peeing. He's pooping everywhere. He can't talk. He has no sense of right and wrong. 
And it is your job, you know, we don't view this as like to rule, but like, I mean, uh, maybe some dads do, right? But it's to rule over your kid to create order, right? To create order. And so what we see for eternity is that somehow, and obviously there seems to be some type of mystery, is that we will reign with Christ and we will continue to create order to cultivate where there was chaos. So what does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? Let me give you an, an image, an example. Uh, there's this movie called The Rider, and it, um, it's about this cowboy who uh, suffers this traumatic brain injury uh, from bucking a bronco. And so the movie's about him recovering and him trying to find purpose. And the same director who directed Nomadland, who won Best Picture, directed this film. And it's a beautiful film. And this one scene, the, the cowboy is uh, introduced to this horse that cannot be tamed. And no matter, uh, you know, everyone's tried to tame this horse. No one can ride this horse. And so they bring this, the cowboy in, like, hey, you got to tame this horse. If not, we got to put this horse down, right? And it's this beautiful scene of this cowboy spending, like, endless amount of hours building trust with this horse, taming this horse, just, uh, you know, just doing what they, the cowboy would do. But by the end of it, he's able to get on that horse the horse is tame, the horse trusts him, and he rides off into the wind. And my friends, that is one of the purposes of what it means to be human. God in Genesis 1 calls, human, calls humans to subdue creation, to bring order out of chaos. And so what does that mean? How do we be a preview of that now when we know we're going to be doing that for eternity? How we become a preview of that is to where there is chaos, reign, bring order, right? So when you're a teacher, you're given a, a classroom, bring order, right? Pick up your chalk and start teaching. If you are a chef, you're given all this type of, all these different ingredients, right? There's a, there's a sense of disorder there. So what do you do? Chefs, man, create order. Create something beautiful. Are you an artist? You have all these different colors. Pick up your brush and paint something beautiful. Are you a builder? Grab your hammer and build something, right? Are you a preacher? Grab your Bible and create order out of chaos, preach a sermon, right? Are you in graphic design or tech? Get your MacBook or whatever you want, right? And, and create an app. But that's what it means to be human. Christians, as heaven, as citizens of heaven, that should make us the best citizens on earth. And how we preview ruling and reigning for eternity, we preview that by doing the best we can for the jobs, the assignments God has on earth. That that is just as, your work is just as much as ministry as my work. It's the same type of kingdom work. And so what we see is in this kingdom of God in Revelation 22, this, it's this holistic picture, right? Nations, it's creation, it's cities. We're ruling alongside God. Everything is as it should be. But that leads us to this question, what's the source of that? What, what's, who's created this? How, how, is every, how is this utopia, how has this been established? What's powering this? And it goes back to verse 1. It's the river of the water of life. It's the river of the water of life that is bringing healing, that's bringing empowerment, that's bringing renewal, that's restoration. And that water of life comes from who? It comes from the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is the one who brings renewal to all things. In my devotions this week, I've been going through Jeremiah and Jeremiah is this prophet to the southern kingdom of Israel, of Judah. And it's a very much gloom and doom. It's very much like a judgment. You've disobeyed God. Judgment's coming for you, book. And in Jeremiah chapter 8, there's this really interesting image. 
and God is judging his people for worshiping idols. And God says, hey, when you are dead, I'm going to take your bones, all you kings, all you priests, all you scholars, all you wise folks, all, uh, everybody, everyone who rejected me, I'm going to take your bones out of your graves and I will lay them at the feet of your gods. And then your gods were the sun, the moon, and the stars. And I will lay them at the feet of your gods and let's see what's going to happen. And you know what God says happens to those bones? Those bones are not resurrected. Rather, those bones, as Jeremiah says, become the dung of the earth. Isn't that interesting? The, the gods that we worship cannot bring dry bones back to life. But in Revelation 22, we see what can bring dry bones back to life. It is the Lamb of God, the one who creates this wellspring of life, who bring, produces the tree of life, who produces the healing of the nations, who produces a city where the sun and the stars are not needed because the glory of Jesus Christ enlightens the whole earth. And how is that possible? How is it possible that frail, that sinful, that weak people like you and I can participate in a kingdom like that? It's possible because the Lamb of God died on the tree of death so that you and I could eat from the fruit of the tree of life. It's possible because the Lamb of God took the cup of wrath that was poured out upon him. Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He drank that cup so that you and I could drink from the river of life. Jesus on the cross, he was in darkness. When he was crucified at noon, darkness covered the whole land because God, his Father, turned his face away from him. All of sin was on Jesus' shoulders. He experienced darkness so that you and I could live in a city with eternal light. Don't you see? Jesus was cast out. He was rejected as a son so that you and I could have Christ's name, his sonship on our face the power to be the preview of the kingdom to come lies in the saving and sacrificial work of the Lamb of God and Jesus Christ. And if you want to experience that power, if you want to experience that healing right now, surrender. <laughs> Fix your eyes on Christ no other God will restore your marriage. No other God will restore your family. No other God will bring justice to a land that is in need of justice. No other God can bring reconciliation, but the Lamb of God can because the Lamb of God died in your place. And as you see him giving his all to you, you then will, your heart will be transformed and you and your brothers and sisters in our church, we can come alongside one another and strive to be the preview of what is to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. God, we look forward to the day of your coming again. God, I... I it's even still hard to fathom what eternity is going to look like. But I know it's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. And God, we long for the day for you to return, to wipe away all tears, and to make all things new. And God, we know that you, you have placed us, your people, for such a time as this, to preview, God, what is to come, to declare and demonstrate the power of the gospel. 
And so God, would we be a people who, who preview your kingdom? Would we worship you the way we are gonna worship you in eternity? Would we love one another, God, uh, the way we're gonna love one another in eternity? God, would we uh, fight against um, the sicknesses, Lord, that are here, the injustices that are here, the way that uh, there will be healing, God, uh, in eternity? And God, would we not do this on our own, but Lord, would we rely on the wellspring, on the river of life found in you? God, would you create um, life, Lord, through us, and that we as your people be the best preview of what is to come. God, thank you for Jesus, for the Lamb of God who was slain, he who knew no sin so that we could become and experience the righteousness of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.